Princess? Yes, I am. You get anything, like a discount? <laughs> Honestly, looks like he's been through hair and makeup. That's your first lion. Yes! <laughs> the Misadventures of Ramesh Ranganathan starts tomorrow at 9 on BBC Two and iPlayer. You ready for this? BBC iPlayer. Love what you find. Find what you love. <laughs> Binge watch brilliant shows. I'm making the same mistakes over and over again. Live stream BBC TV. Unbelievable! Find your next big obsession. This is good. We're going to have some fun. Just press red. Who are you talking to? They're my home. For the best way to watch TV on BBC iPlayer. Welcome to Germany. This is the Euros, where anything can happen. Let the fun begin. Finds him again, John McGinn! Intercepted by Modric. It's a lovely stop from Stay there. The referee is not happy. Big medal in that system. Bellingham, Bellingham all the way! And it's saved by Tony Roma. It's magnificent! Euro 2024 starts Friday 14th of June across the BBC. Time for Newsnight now on BBC Two with Victoria Derbyshire. Hello. This morning we revealed that the investigation into Diane Abbott's comments on racism finished five months ago. Twelve hours after our story dropped, the Labour leadership have lifted her suspension. But is she banned from standing as a Labour candidate in this election? Plus, the Conservatives say if they win the election, they will protect pensioners from their own future tax rises. But are they neglecting young voters? Hi, welcome to Election Newsnight. We are live each weeknight at half past ten on BBC Two and BBC News and iPlayer with interviews and insight with me throughout the programme this evening. Labour MP Dawn Butler and former Conservative Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, who, like around 76 of his Tory colleagues, is standing down. First, let's bring you up to date with today's election stories, starting with our exclusive that we broke this morning, that the Labour investigation into Diane Abbott over her comments on racism was finished five months ago. And tonight, the Labour leadership have lifted their suspension of her and restored the whip. Nick is here. Bring our viewers up to date. Well, Vic, as you were saying earlier this evening, Sir Alan Campbell, who is the opposition chief whip, wrote to Diane Abbott uh, saying that the Labour whip had been restored to her. And what that means is that this allows Britain's first black woman MP to end this parliament as a Labour MP nearly 40 years after her election for Labour. And the big question, as you're saying, Vic, now is will Diane Abbott contest this general election? It is a very good question. And what you're referring to is that there is an email uh, from Sir Alan Campbell to Diane Abbott, which I have seen a screenshot of. And in it, he suggests to her that she has indicated an intention to retire at this election. As I understand it, Miss Abbott has never made that commitment to the party. And in a sense, that takes us to the heart of where we are now. So there is a belief amongst uh, some of Diane Abbott's supporters in the campaign group. That's the former Jeremy Corbyn group uh, on, on the left of the party, still very much alive, but obviously Jeremy Corbyn is not a Labour MP. Uh, view amongst some in that group that Diane Abbott will not be standing in this general election. Diane Abbott has not told them that. That is just what they believe, the direction that we're heading in. But there is an even stronger uh, view amongst supporters of Keir Starmer that Diane Abbott must not stand in this election. So what the, St the Keir Starmer group are saying, uh, allies close to the leader of the Labour Party, is they want dignity for Diane Abbott. Uh, one of his allies described her to me as an icon 
of the Labour movement. But they equally say that Diane Abbott cannot stay because she is, in their view, a reminder of the Jeremy Corbyn era, which they say was an era of failure. And one ally told me that on the doorstep, that incident where Diane Abbott, when she was Shadow Home Secretary in a general election campaign, struggling to sort of explain the numbers behind a policy, they say that comes up on the doorstep and that is damaging. And there may well be enough in that panel report, the report of that NEC, National Executive Committee, the Labour Party, that panel report that you reported on, that would stop Diane Abbott from standing. So that panel issued a formal, as you say, warning after saying that Diane Abbott had, and this is the wording, had engaged in conduct that was, in the opinion of the NEC, prejudicial and grossly detrimental to the Labour Party. Now, under the law, a political party is allowed to say... We believe this person would not be in our political interest to have them as a candidate. That is how they blocked uh, Jeremy Corbyn. So, look, Vic, that was your story. You reported it, came out early this morning. Then things moved really quickly this evening. Yeah, and I think th the significant thing from this morning was the Labour's National Executive Committee. We were able to reveal that it completed its investigation into Diane Abbott last December. Remember, she'd written a letter to The Observer in April 2023, suggesting that Jewish, Irish and traveller people uh, did experience prejudice, but did not, they were not subject to racism all their lives. Uh, so the NEC investigated, they issued her a formal warning, they required her to complete an online e-module, which I'm told was a, a, an online anti-Semitism awareness course. Diane Abbott did that in February. And since then, this matter has been in the hands of Labour's chief whip, Sir Alan Campbell. Um... That's right. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as you reported this morning, we had the panel reaching its conclusion in December. Then in February, Diane Abbott completes this online course. And as you're saying, Vic, at that point, it passes yeah. to the chief whip, Sir Alan Campbell. Uh, what is the primary job of the chief whip? Well, it's not a great secret in Westminster. I think our colleagues can confirm sure. that. The role of a chief whip is to enforce the will and the authority of the leader of their party. And yet, as recently as Friday, Keir Starmer told the BBC that Diane Appert is, and this is what he said, is going through and being part of and getting to the end of a disciplinary process because of something she has said. Part of a disciplinary process. When it was with the panel, yes, it was arm's length. Since February, it's been with a member of his shadow cabinet. Now, that has been seized on by the Tories. So tonight, the chairman of the Conservative Party, Richard Holden, said Sir Keir Starmer has blatantly lied to the British people and has serious questions to answer. And I do have to say that Diane Abbott's allies are furious. One told me that the Labour leadership has behaved in a shameful manner towards her. They're talking about a lack of respect to a very significant figure. But interestingly, members of the campaign group, very nervous about speaking out, they're worried that if they do that, they'll find that they're not Labour candidates at the general election. Well, let's bring in uh, Labour MP Dawn <coughs> Butler, who is a friend of Diane Abbott's. Kwasi Kwarteng is with us as well, former Conservative Chancellor. Uh, Dawn Butler, your reaction? Well, I think there's a lot to unpack in, in all of that. I think fundamentally, um, Diane was the first elected black female MP in our country, and that is something to be proud of. And when I entered Parliament in 2005, there were just two of us, just me and Diane. They couldn't tell us apart, but that's just another matter, but there were just two of us. And it was, I think it's important that um, the whip was returned to Diane. She went through the process. I think it was really important the whip was returned to her. And I think fundamentally, in all that you've been speaking about today, um, and Keir said this in his last speech to the Parliamentary Labour Party, is that we are a team. And I think the Labour Party has to act as a team. And I do feel that there are some people around Keir, not Keir himself, that maybe have watched a little bit too much scandal or, or you know what I mean, the West Wing and think that's how politics is done. That isn't how politics is done. And it is important that somebody like Diane, you know, gets her due respect. Do you think she has been given due respect? Well... Obviously, it's great that you broke the story today and kind of unpicked what was happening. Um, but I think it's important that we end the day the right way that Diane has had the rip rest whip restored. And the other thing is, is that it's up to Diane to decide uh, what she wants to do next. And I'm sure she will. But that's, that's the interesting bit, isn't it? Because 
it's all very well to give the whip back to her. But the question still remains whether she's going to be a candidate or not. And, and only time will tell. I suppose we'll know when the nominations have to be uh, handed in. But it's whether it should be her decision. Absolutely. Or the leadership's That's decision. That's right. But then, but then there are ways the leadership can lean on people. And we don't know. There might have been deals done. She might have been told you can get the whip back on condition that you don't stand again. We don't know the full story. And actually, you know, when I look back last week, there were two Conservative MPs. One of them was Matt Hancock. I think the other was Bob Stewart, who were given the whip back. But it was clear they'd said to everybody that they weren't standing again. Mm. So it was a kind of formal recognition of the fact that they would leave Parliament as Conservative MPs. But we still don't know whether Diane will be a candidate or not. I mean, there's a bit of a delicate dance going on, which is the whip has been restored to Diane Abbott. And I think the hope in the leadership is that would allow Diane Abbott, after nearly 40 years, to leave Parliament mm. with dignity. Um, but I think that Diane Abbott very much wants to have that dignity. And I think the view amongst many of her allies is that it's a bit late in the day for the Labour Party suddenly but to sort her hand her dignity. And so she doesn't want to be seen to being forced and reports this evening Diane Abbott to be blocked. Yes. She That's probably would be if she tried but to what do we think? Do you think she'll? Do you think she'll stand again? I mean, you're, what's your well, sense? Well, it, it would be wrong of me to pretend that I know exactly what sure. is going to happen. Mm. But my instinct is, from talking to allies of Diane Abbott, is that she won't stand again, mm. but she doesn't want to look like her hand has it's been forced. forced. Yeah. It's all about but I, dignity. I have seen a screenshot uh, of an email that was sent from Labour's chief whip to Diane Abbott, in which he suggests that she has indicated well, that she is yeah, going yes, to retire. Yes, yes. My understanding is she she's never indicated that to Labour leadership. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng, let me ask you. I mean, mm. Dawn mentioned that, that Diane Abbott was the first black woman to be elected Absolutely. to Westminster. And you remember that? Moment. I remember. I remember the 1987 election. Didn't really understand that much about politics um, uh, then. And um, I remember very vividly seeing four MPs uh, who were ethnic minority MPs. And it was the first time, certainly in the 20th century, that that had happened. There were other... Um, ethnic uh, MPs in earlier, in earlier decades. But it was the first time, uh, certainly since the war, that we saw uh, ethnic minority MPs mm. being returned to Westminster. So whatever, and I didn't really have... And you have were what age? 12. Right. And I'm 49 now. Was it a big deal? Yeah, it was a, I remember watching it and thinking, mm. that's, that's a step forward. That's mm. something that is new and good. Um, and I remember Paul Boateng, I think Keith Faz, Diane Abbott and Bernie Grant... Mm. who sadly has passed away, um, being, being introduced effectively into Westminster. They, they'd won their elections, mm. they were on the hustings, they, they, they were being returned. And that was definitely a moment in post-war history. Mm. More from you in a moment. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, for all the election content, BBC iPlayer has launched a live stream with the latest from Vote 2024. And you can also watch the best Newsnight interviews on our YouTube channel. Let's talk now to James Murray, who has been put up by Labour this evening. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, the Tories tonight are calling Sakir Starmer a liar over this uh, Di Diane Abbott uh, latest news. Is he? No, look, I think there's been a process which has been gone through here about Diane and what she wrote in that letter uh, last year. And I think, you know, what she wrote in the letter was wrong and it was right there was an investigation into it. Um, I think I'm really glad that the process has now come to a conclusion, you know, and she's now um, got the whip back because I think none of us wanted to be um, in this situation. Sir Keir Starmer told the BBC on Friday, Diane Abbott is going through and being part of and getting to the end of a disciplinary process. That process has been in the hands of the Chief Whip since February, March. Who does the Chief Whip report to? Well, the Chief Whip obviously uh, works with, with the leader of the Labour Party, but it's not a process that I have any inside knowledge on. And, you know, no. I think it's really... But, but I think you it's must have really asked the question before you came on Newsnight tonight. Yes, but I don't know the answer to it because I'm not, I don't have any insight into that process. Did you I not say, it's... what's our line, what are we saying tonight? Well, I, I obviously knew, uh, spoke to the press office about me coming on uh, to the show what tonight. What did they tell you to say? They, didn't tell, they told me what, had, what we know has happened, which is that the whip has been restored. But this process is not one which is you know, discussed within the Labour Party because it is at arm's length. It is something that MPs like myself have no connection with and no involvement but in. It's and not no at arm's length from on. the leadership and hasn't been since February when Diane Abbott completed her anti-Semitism course. It's been 
at the, uh, in the hands of the Chief Whip, who reports to Sir Keir Starmer. Sir Keir Starmer has complete authority over the Chief Whip. Um, if Diane Abbott wants to stand at this election, will she be able to? Well, as you say, it's a decision for, for Diane whether she wants to stand, and then there's a the process which it's goes her, through. It's her decision. Well, as all of us as MPs, we the, the process of deciding whether you end up being a candidate, obviously you personally have to decide if you want to stand, and then there's a party process about whether you get the party nomination, and that's what's going to happen, I guess, over the next week now that the decision about in, the Because candidates in, in, in Hackney, North and Stoke Newington have adopted her. Well, no, I'm saying that there's a process. I mean, it works differently because an election has just been called now. And so obviously candidates have to get in place very quickly. Sure. These things usually speed up uh, when an election is called in the way that it has been uh, just now. But there is a process now that the whip has been restored to Diane. And as I say, I'm glad that process has come to a conclusion. There's now the process of working out if she's restanding and who the candidate is in that constituency. Do you think she should be able to stand if she wants to? Um, well, that's a process which the party sure, will go but through. What do you so think? But well, it's not for me to say. It's a process of we the party. We must have an opinion. Well, I don't think it's right for me to involve myself in that. That's a I'm decision for the party. I'm not asking you to involve yourself. I'm just asking you, as a, as, a, as a member of the shadow front bench squad, what your opinion is. Do you think, Diane Abbott, now the whip has been restored, she should be able to make a decision about whether she stands or not? Well, she, 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 she will make a decision, and then, the, and then the party will make a decision about whether she gets the party in, in, endorsement. OK, so it's not really her decision then? Well, it, it's, it's, it's two parts, isn't it? Because, you know, if I want to stand for, for election, I have to decide I want to be a candidate, and then I have to get adopted by the party. That's the same for all candidates and all people who want to become MPs. What's the difference between Diane Abbott and Steve Reid, who apologised unreservedly after calling a Jewish Conservative donor a puppet master in 2020? He wasn't suspended or investigated, and a spokesman for Sir Keir Starmer at the time said, Steve deleted the tweet and did not mean to cause any offence. Look, it's absolutely not for me um, as an MP to start passing judgment um, about different MPs and what they've said. There is a process... Sorry, is there, is there anything for you that you can answer tonight? In, in terms of MPs... Uh, disciplinary processes, no, because that's not me to decide. There was that's no not disciplinary for me to decide. process for Steve Reid. That's why I'm asking you. Well, there was no also... disciplinary process for him, it would seem, because he deleted the tweet and, according to a spokesman, did not mean to cause offence. Whereas Diane Abbott, who apologised on the same day as her letter was published and withdrew her remarks immediately, was investigated for eight months. The point I'm making is that we have disciplinary processes, which obviously involves the decision of whether to investigate and how it's investigated and so on. And that's not something that MPs like myself have any involvement with or connection with, in, into. And that's right. Well, you let know, me put right, to you. Could it, could right, it be that because... It's, no, it's, it's right that MPs like myself are not involved in that. And that gives the process, you know, separation between people like myself um, and, and those who are conducting the investigation. Is it because Steve Reid is a essentially a political soulmate of Sir Keir Starmer, whereas Diane Abbott is clearly on the left of the party. Look, I think it's really important that the process of investigation uh, looks at all MPs and, and makes sure that if anyone has said or done anything which warrants investigation, that they are fully investigated, whoever they are. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Thank you. James Murray. Right, we will be talking to the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, in a few minutes' time. But first, let's talk again to our panel, Kwasi Kwarteng and Dawn Bottlett, who are here with us. Um, let me ask you, Kwasi Kwarteng, about Hello. the two big announcements we've had from the Tories so far in this election campaign. Compulsory national service for 18-year-olds and the Triple Lock Plus, as the Conservatives are calling it, protecting pensions from future Tory that's, tax that's rises. Right. What do you think? Well, I think they're targeted... Policies. The Nationals... Um, Targeted. Targeted. Well, that's, you know, clearly a, 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 a policy... No, no. Clearly a policy about the, 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 the triple lock plus for pensioners is targeted at pensioners. It's saying we're going to look after you as pensioners. That's a targeted policy. And I think it will, be, it will go down well. National service is generally quite popular. Now, you can not argue about the... Not with 18-year-olds, but, but generally across the, uh, across the country, people understand that there's an argument to be had about, or discussion rather, about trying to foster national cohesiveness. Mm. Uh, we're very divided as a society. We've got lots of different uh, strands. And in order to pull them together, uh, people, uh, many people, and I, one of them, think national service is a good idea. 
Is it? Is it that? Sorry, go on. I was going to, do you really think that's the idea to pull people together? Of course it is. I mean, there are lots, the of, there are lots of. No, it's ridiculous. There's lots of different schemes. There's a Mayen scheme, for instance, that was launched in Brent the other day by the mm. Mayor of London. That gets all young people from different postcodes together. Sure. They do sports. That's they good. do education. I mean, that is, you know, that's that and that is doable than like this national sk national so, service scheme, which has gone across billions of pounds, hasn't been costed. The army doesn't like it. I mean, it's a crazy. It's just no, a grab I, I headlines. Don't, but I don't think the it's Prime crazy. Minister, though, he grabbed the headlines. I don't think for a it's few crazy. Days. The fact that we're discussing it shows that it's been effective in terms it of. It shows that uh, he did the, what he uh, wanted the, to the do. The publicity and the engagement. And I think ultimately, actually, there's a serious debate to be had about whether you want to have national service. And it's not some sort of outlandish thing. I mean, it happens in Sweden, it happens in Norway. I think the French it's have had it and now want to go thing. back. Uh, want to go back to it. So it's not something that's uh, It particularly is pretty unusual. different in Sweden, it has to be said. Um, I want to talk to you about the economy, obviously. Former Chancellor, former Business Secretary, Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer announced today they had over 100 businesses endorsing mm. them. They talked repeatedly about economic stability. Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt, your successor, they say they've brought economic stability after mm. the turbulence of yours and Liz Truss's mm. uh, mini-budget. And I want to show you this... Uh, graph, if I can, it's coming any second now, I'm told. Here it is. And you can see the exact moment when voters started to trust Labour over the Tories on the economy. And it is the time of your mini yes. budget. I mean, we know Thanks that. Thanks for that. Well, we know that it was a turbulent <laughs> time. It was. But does, uh, that, does, that, does that keep you awake at night? No, because it doesn't keep me awake at night because I, I think that we've had 20 months, that was 20 months ago, and I had thought we would be able to close the gap. I lost my job, mm -hmm. rightly, perhaps, wrongly. I mean, I, I paid the price. Wrongly? Um, well, Do you think I you mean, should have kept your job? Well, well, the idea when she sacked me was that she was going to preserve her, 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 her political life, and that she lasted a week, so that and didn't you work. Told, you told Liz. I said that, that's exactly what, <laughs> said exactly what would happen. Mm. But that's uh, all on the bridge. Forget but the I point is, thought. the Tories have not I agree, but, regained but, but their, their, their that's trust true. voters. But what I'm saying to you is that we've had 20 months mm. where we could have rebuilt that, and for whatever reason, that hasn't happened. But what you can't do is say, uh, come in and say, we're going to rebuild that trust, and then when there's a deficit, go back 20 months and say, well, we couldn't do anything. I'm not saying that the leaders are, do are saying that, but we have had the opportunity. And I think, actually, a lot of that will close uh, during the course of the campaign. I think... Uh, it hasn't so far, even well, with 4% cut in national insurance. Well, well yeah, it's, it's taken a while, mm. but I think people will focus on the Labour offer... Uh, during the campaign, and I think we'll have. An I think at the end of the to, day, to... people want change. I mean, they're like they've had enough of all of this chaos, and they're like, you know what? We want change. Dawn, can I ask you, if I may? Uh, Labour supports the Conservatives' triple lock. They've made that clear on pensions, mm -hmm. but but not what the Tories call the triple lock plus. Do you know why? Well, I haven't actually delved into the detail of the triple lock plus, but what I do know is that we have been trying to push the Tory party for a long time to protect pensions, to protect the sure. triple lock, to not backtrack on the promises. You've got, you've got the waspy women that, you know, have been mistreated by this government and there's so much to do. So it's not going to be an easy job if Labour's lucky enough to get into government, but it is a job that I think we are ready prepared to do. And you know, businesses, people, they like Rachel Reeves. They like what she has to say. I should just so say, I, interestingly, so Rachel Reeves' team have sort of doing the calculator this weekend. They're saying since this campaign was launched, uh, Rishi Sunak has spent five billion pounds and they're saying it hasn't been costed and interestingly, two days in a row, how do they fund the National Service? How do they fund Triple Lock Plus? from cracking down on tax evasions, uh, evasion and tax avoidance. I think well, we've heard that one before. Because, uh, well, no, that's true. Let's find out, because we are going to talk now to the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, who is uh, sitting over here by Regent Street. Thank you very much for talking to our viewers tonight, Not Mr all. Harper. On your pensions announcement today, then, just to be clear, what you're doing is unfreezing the freeze that the Prime Minister brought in when he was Chancellor, correct? We're saying that for pensioners, Correct. we'll uprate the personal allowance in line with the triple lock so that under us, if you only have the basic state pension, you won't pay any tax on it. And as you've just discussed, Labour won't match that. So if Labour were to get in, there would effectively be a retirement tax on pensioners because uh, someone for the first time ever who only had the basic state pension under Labour would pay income tax. Right. 
but you're unfreezing the freeze that Rishi Sunak brought in. And I'm just wondering if that's part of the reason why you want another five years, to correct the mistakes you've made in the past 14. No, they, they, they weren't mistakes. Look, very simply, the thing well, that... Well, you've just well, reversed well, it. Well, hang on. The thing that people keep forgetting when we have this discussion is that there was a global pandemic which cost us £400 billion to protect uh, millions of jobs and thousands of businesses. And that has to be paid for. And that's meant we've had to make some very difficult decisions, um, not being able to cut taxes as fast as we would like to, uh, and spending money. And actually, people realise that. I have businesses in my constituency sure. that say to me today they only have a business because Rishi Sunak protected it when he was Chancellor. And, and they haven't you, forgotten, and they won't forget on the 4th of July. Uh, let me ask about how you say you would fund this. Mm -hmm. It is one of the biggest fiscal announcements in the election campaign uh, when it comes to the Tories so far. You claim you can fund it by clamping down on tax avoidance. So how come there is still two and a half billion pounds of tax being avoided after 14 years of Tory government? Well, we have said we can do that, and we know we can do that so because... So the question was, how come you've left this well, uncollected well, for 14 well, years? First of all, the tax gap, the gap between what you could collect and what you collect, is actually smaller now than it ever has been, because consistently, over the period we've been in government, we have been getting in that sort of money, £6 billion a year, every year, uh, and we can but use that... But you've suddenly found, apparently, another two and a well, half billion of, of tax no, that's been avoided. No, we're going to carry on cracking down on evasion and avoidance at about the same level that we have done. That raises £6 billion, £2.4 billion of which we're going to use to protect pensioners. Okay. We think that's the right thing to do. We've, we've protected the, we, we introduced and have kept the triple lock. Triple lock plus means that someone on a basic state pension doesn't pay any tax Thank on you. it. News viewers definitely understand that. And when were you told about this... Uh, pensions triple lock plus? Uh, well, we were briefed on it ahead of the public announcement. When was that? So, well, uh, we briefed by the Work and Pension Secretary ahead of the public announcement. When, last night, this morning, yesterday? No, ahead of the public announcement. I'm not going to go into the details. But of you were we told about it before? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I was. Yeah. And when were you told about the compulsory national service? So I was briefed about that in advance as well, as you would expect as a member of the Cabinet. OK. I'm going to ask you if... I've got a clip that I want to play you from ITV. Uh, let's have a look at it. This is Rishi Sunak okay. talking to loose women. I think your heart's in the right place, but why do you hate pensioners? <laughs> why do you hate pensioners? So is that why he's brought in this triple lot plus, so people like Janet Street Porter and others can't say that to him? Well, I, I, don't, I think that's frankly a ridiculous comment for her to say. We have, since we've been in government, we have introduced the triple lock. We've made sure that pensioners in this country have had a consistent rise in income. Um, and this, I think, actually goes very nicely with what we've been doing for people of working age, where, which is we've cut national insurance contributions. So we're cutting taxes on working people. So someone on average income's had a £900 tax cut. And this makes sure we protect pensioners. It's properly costed, properly funded. And I think it's a very good policy. And I think it'll be very popular. To paraphrase Janet Street Porter, I could ask you, why do you hate young people? Well, we don't. I don't know why you would say that. We've well, just let, let cut. You, we've cut. Let me tell you well, why I'm asking. Let me tell you why I'm asking. All right, and then I'll Compa tell you why that's not true. Compared to what you've done for pensioners, look at what you've done for young people. You're going to force them to do national service. You've tripled their tuition fees. You froze the threshold at which they have to start paying back their student loan. You've extended the student loan repayment term from 30 to 40 years, meaning many graduates will be paying off the debt in their 60s. You invested only a third of what was recommended by the catch-up czar. Uh, to help kids catch up after the pandemic. Rents rose nearly 9% in the last year and houses are, are at their most expensive since 1876. That's why I ask, have the Tories got a problem with young people? No, not at all. That's why, for example, we've cut national insurance contributions for working people. That applies to everyone who works for a living. We've increased the national living wage to a record level to make sure those on the lowest incomes have had significant rises. And your point actually about tuition fees, mm -hmm. uh, I strongly believe in tuition fees for this reason. Well, if you look at the parts of the UK where they don't exist in Scotland, that means what you do is you, you uh, limit opportunities by limiting the number of people that can go to university. If you come from a poor background in Scotland, you're less likely to have the chance of going to university than someone from the same background in England. I'm the first person... Well, even though it's free? 
Yes, because what they do in Scotland is they limit the number of people that get those opportunities. So okay. if you come from a I'd background like mine, myself. I'd, if you get from a background like mine, working class background, you've got less chance of having that opportunity in Scotland than you do in England. I would have to. That's why that. I'm a conservative because we believe in opportunities for everybody. Thank you very much for talking to our audience. Pleasure. Thank you, Mark Harper, who is the Transport Secretary, as you know. Right, let's have a quick look at some of tomorrow's newspapers. So we've got the Daily Telegraph, Sunak. I'm talking to Johnson about the election. Maybe I'll mention that to Kwasi Kwarteng in just a moment. The Times. Sunak plans university cuts to boost apprentices. I uh, should have put that to Mark Harper. Daily Mail. Tory vow to ban rip-off university degrees by changing the law. Financial Times. Off what sketches out recovery regime to avoid nationalising nationalizing water groups. Uh, the I, I think we have. Triple lock plus to save retirees 28p a week on the state pension. And then front page of The Guardian, Israeli spy chief threatened ICC official over war crimes inquiry. Right, uh, Sir Ed Davey, leader of the Lib Dems, uh, got on a paddleboard today and guess what happened? Uh, did it look a little bit staged? I wonder, um, Sir Ed Davey has been in touch with a message for you. I hear people wonder whether I fell in deliberately at the Windham Electric. I fell in five times. Uh, they were not all intentional, but it was a serious message about the fact that sewage is a big problem, not just in the Lake District, but in lakes and rivers and beaches across our country. And the issue about sewage be on the ballot paper on July the 4th. Um, I know you're revamping Newsnight. I hope it goes really well. The best of luck. And I'm looking forward to being on your programme. Um, so is that going to happen? People will fall off paddle balls in election I campaigns. I hope you don't swallow anything. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of uh, sewage in our waterways. 14 years of a it looked, Tory government. That's, it looked uh, pretty staged lowered, to me. Lowered the, and I have to say that I thought, I mean, I saw one wag, one person say that that's the biggest splash they're going to make in the campaign. <laughs> Um, which All was, publicity is good publicity. True. I think that's true. Davey is the only politician who can get away with this because he embraces his centrist dad. Whenever they have by-election council successes, do. they do all these stunts and it's because he says, Matt I'm Hancock, a happy... Matt Hancock they are did all of that in the jungle. He did all and lost the whip. But the, point <laughs> is, the point is that even Ed Davey would say he's not a candidate to be Prime Minister. Mm. He's a candidate... Well, I'm like last time. I'm like <laughs> <Joe> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm like Joseph. Right, he, he's a, a, a candidate to, excuse the pun, make way and trouble for okay. the other parties, right. but he can get away with that. He gets away yeah. with that. Yeah, that's true. Um, but in terms of his team around him going, OK, let's put you on a paddleboard, yeah. are, are they thinking it wouldn't really be a disaster if you fell off? Yeah, of course yeah they loved that. it. I mean, they're they're, you know, he's got We're talking the about it. I if mean, he stayed on, we wouldn't be talking yeah. about this. He dived, though, didn't he? I mean, he didn't fall. He yeah. dived forward, dived to the side. I'm not sure Those about that. Typical I don't think he's got an amazing... I mean, I'm, it takes one to know one. I don't think he's got a great sense of balance, to be honest. <laughs> Okay. But, um, How do you know that? Well, well, just looking. <laughs> just looking. He's worst a, worst you know. stunt you've ever pulled in order to win an election? Not Ooh. that. Not the paddleboard That's thing. I'm trying to think. Interesting question. Uh, yes, I can think of one or two hmm. things. Worst yeah. stunt that was pulled on you, being sacked on Twitter? That was not cool. Okay. I saw that. Yeah, so that was... Well, I knew that it was, it was the truth. I've that got was... a question for you, then. Yeah, sure. So did you put in a letter of no confidence in Rishi? No, never did that. Because... Never did that for any leader. Really? I've never put in a no confidence Is the letter. reason why he called the general election because the letters were going in? No, and he thought, right, that. I'll get I back at everybody. I think he thought this was as good a time as any. The worst thing you can do when you're sort of in the bunker is give the impression that you're just clinging on to dear life. And he didn't want to do that. And he felt that, you know, in terms of the inflation figure, okay. he was doing what he, he wanted to do, what he'd set out. Okay. Uh, and that was a good reason for him to call the election. Thank you. John Butler, Kwasi Kwarteng. Thank you very much, Nick, as always. See you tomorrow. That's it from us. Election News Night is with you each weeknight from half past ten with live interviews and insight and loads of analysis. Plus, we're live, so you never quite know what's going to happen. See you tomorrow.
Good evening. By the end of this week, the weather should look a little bit drier, but not just yet. Further very heavy downpours to come over the next couple of days, but with some spells of sunshine in between. Low pressure then in charge of the scene right now. This area of low pressure slowly migrating eastwards, 